Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and my last two videos were about someone called Matt, so I thought I'd make a third video about yet another Matt. Now, unlike our previous two Matts, this one doesn't say anything vile that I'm aware of, so that is a good start. So from what I can tell, this person maybe used to go by Raw Matt, but seems to now go by Matt Man, but their channel is... I've forgotten what their channel is called. Ah, Young Earth Creation. You know, considering that they've gone by Raw Matt and Matt Man, I'd think that their channel would have a more creative name than that. So as you can probably tell, they are a Young Earth Creationist. And today, they're going to try and present some evidence for a Young Earth. So what have you got for us, Matt? Today, I thought I would touch on a couple things that I really think are great evidence for Young Earth creation, and that is symbiotic relationships. Everybody's heard of them, but today we're going to cover some things that I think are very fascinating. So, of course, symbiotic relationships are pretty interesting. My guess is that he's going to focus on one particular kind of symbiotic relationship. That type of symbiotic relationship, of course, being mutualism, where it is beneficial to both species. A common example of this is when birds eat ticks off of mammals. This is good for both parties because the birds get a nice feed and the mammals have less ticks to deal with. On the surface, I can see how this might be perceived as evidence for creation. Species working together to provide benefits for one another, not in direct competition with one another. However, given that these relationships are possible and don't really seem all that difficult to occur, you would expect evolution to produce them. Especially seeing as mammals can survive with ticks, and ticks aren't the only food source for birds. Neither species is reliant on the other, but they do benefit each other. Before I jump directly into that though, I wanted to ask a general, basic, logical question that I think anybody can follow along with. And that is, what is this right here? Uh, that looks like it is a flat earther's brain. It's walnut. Are you sure it's a walnut? I mean, it is a little bit big, but it does really look like a flat earther's brain to me. Does this think? Well, no, of course not. Flat earthers aren't really known for thinking. Does this know anything? Again, flat earthers aren't really known for knowing things. I don't think anybody would conclude, yes, of course they do. No, no one would. See, flat earthers, even Matt here agrees that you don't think and you don't know anything. Everyone says, no, it doesn't have a brain. It doesn't, it doesn't rationalize anything. You can't debate it. It doesn't process tomorrow. Okay, Matt, now you're just being silly. Everybody knows that Nathan Oakley's debate team is the biggest debate platform on the internet, despite the fact that no debates happen on it anymore. And that might have something to do with the fact that you can't debate flat or... Oh. The question arises, how does it know when to grow? Are you sure that it's ever grown though? Because flat earthers aren't really known for being mature adults. How does it know when to sprout? Because if this falls off the tree in winter, it won't do anything. Because it knows, wait a minute, but it can't know anything. Yet, it knows to not sprout then, because it will die in winter. So I don't think that it needs to know when to sprout. I think that it just needs a mechanism that causes it to sprout at a particular time of year. And there are a couple of things that can cause this, like, I don't know, the amount of light that the tree is receiving. Oh, and by the way, we're talking about walnuts now, not flat earthers' brains. So that brings us to the next question. If it doesn't know anything, it means this is there's only one option left and that is this is programmed this was designed to be like this that's its function come on matt surely you can think of other ways except for it was designed right because i can certainly easily think of a way that evolution could have guided that process and that is because a tree that produces nuts at a particular time of year is going to be far better at reproducing than a tree that produces nuts all year round where more nuts will die. That really just requires a few mutations and natural selection, of course. It doesn't know when winter is or when spring is. It was designed to fall on the ground in spring, and when warm water rushes over it, it blanches and begins to sprout and grow into a tree. That's a natural design. Okay, so I am a nut expert, but that is more flat earther type nuts, not these nuts. But here's the thing, as far as I can tell, walnuts do not actually fall in spring. Funnily enough, they actually fall in... Oh, what's that season called again? Um, 
Autumn. I don't expect you to be a nut expert, but it's probably a good idea to know these things if you're going to try and make a point with them. That brings us to our next topic, and that is symbiotic relationships. And what better thing to look at than a bird? Oh, are we going to learn how birds eat ticks off mammals? Because I already talked about that. Because a bird has a massive influence on the world around us, and we just don't even know that it does. For example, did you know that not even trees could exist without this bird? You know, I very much doubt that. I think that without that bird, trees would be doing just fine. In fact, some trees might not like the hairdo that birds give them. And I don't think a lot of people know that. Maybe that's because it's just not true at all and trees can survive perfectly fine without birds. And that's because the frequency of their chirp, the bird chirp, opens up the stomata on the bottom of the leaf and allows the plant to breathe oxygen. That's right. And it also will allow this plant to grow bigger, better, and stronger, depending on how many birds there are. So without birds and without the chirping in the morning, they will not allow the stomata on the bottom of these plants to even open. Our survey said... That is just not true at all. Things like sunlight can cause the stomata to open. This is because sunlight causes photosynthesis. So that is a perfect time to open the stomata. Now, of course, there are other mechanisms, especially considering that stomata is also used as a cooling mechanism. So temperature also plays a role in them opening and closing. And because it's water vapor going through the stomata that causes the plant to cool down, also the amount of water that the plant has will be a factor as well. Now, of course, other mechanisms are at play here, but I thought I'd share those ones because those are the ones that I remember from high school. But this is the man who invented it. He doesn't really look like God to me because I don't think that God would have glasses, but I guess he does have the beard and the white hair for it. His name is Dr. Dan Carlson Sr. And in 1970 s to assist with conventional and organic farming, particularly with low water availability and poor soil conditions, he wanted to come up with a concept of what can I do to make these plants grow bigger. Now, forgive me for being a bit of a cynic here, but I think that the main thing on his mind was how do I make some money? I say this because he seems to be more connected to a product that he has patented, pat, patented rather than research. He's holding the exact same plant in both hands and they are the same age. Now, that's what really matters. Why? Because all he did different was replicate the sound of the frequency that birds chirp and he isolated and played it directly to those plants that you see in his left hand on the right hand side of the screen. And that allowed these plants to grow rapidly. Except that doesn't seem to be the only thing that he did, at least not as far as I can tell. As far as I can tell, he also used other products in order to grow bigger plants, like red wine microbes. Surasik is going to be very disappointed that he didn't use whiskey. Also, there is a good question of why would forcing stomata to open allow plants to grow more rapidly? On the surface of it, it does seem quite logical, you know, more carbon dioxide goes in. However, as I mentioned earlier, stomata are used as a cooling mechanism by the plant. So even though a lot of carbon dioxide might be going in, a lot of water is coming out. Now this is particularly bad because this means that the plant would be losing water at a faster rate. Now this would reduce the plant's ability to regulate its temperature, which is kind of important when it comes to plants. Now of course I could always be wrong about this. I mean I'm not a plant expert, I am a nut expert. So stomata opening could be good all the time and I'm just big dum dum. However, I suspect that I might not be wrong here. Being a scientist and family of farmers, He noticed that he was abruptly woken up in the morning, an hour before the sun rose every single day to uh, birds chirping and being very loud. And he was wondering, why in the world are they doing this? Clearly, this isn't a mating call. So what's happening and why do they do it year round? So being a scientist, being investigating this, he thought the next thing, logical thing to do would be like, let's test the surrounding area. And he soon discovered that it was the plants that... would open up the stomata 
based on the frequencies from these birds. Okay, I just have to point out how none of this makes any sense whatsoever. Like, I don't think that birds chirp because they're trying to open stomata. In fact, I can find a couple of reasons why they chirp. One of the reasons is to announce their territory. The other is, well, mating calls. Now, let's talk about stomata and birds chirping before the sun comes up. Given that that's usually a time when the plants can't really do any photosynthesis, it doesn't really make any sense to open the stomata up then, especially seeing as early in the morning tends to be quite cold, so it also have no reason to try and cool itself down. Now you could try and say that it's just preparing the ingredients for photosynthesis, but even then it doesn't make a lot of sense because of the angle of the sun in the morning. During the morning, because the sun is at a different angle to let's say midday, then you actually get less light, which would mean that less photosynthesis would take place. So that raises the question, how would birds chirping before the sun is up help plants grow better. If plants can't exist without these birds and these frequencies, what did they do before birds existed? You can't have it, right? Matt, the problem is, is that you are assuming that bird chirping is the only way that stomata can open. This is kind of like what flat earthers do when they assume that there's only one thing that can cause a particular thing. It is known that things like light and temperature can cause stomata to open. Yep, just a nice little symbiotic relationship there. We also see it in different things like fig trees and wasps. There's a fig wasp and a fig tree, and the, and the wasp pollinates the fig tree. Another great symbiotic relationship where they, they get along together and they work together to support each other. Okay, that is the argument that Matt should have gone with from the start, rather than this trees need birds kind of stuff. Now, when it comes to fig trees and fig wasps, it's generally accepted that this is a form of coevolution. Even Jesus thinks that it's a form of coevolution. Why do you think that Jesus didn't like figs? Well, it's clearly because it's the one plant that actually evolved. But in all seriousness, I can actually see how this might come about through evolution. Now, let's say that you just start with a regular fruit and a wasp. And this wasp decides, okay, let's lay my eggs within a particular fruit. And maybe there's some kind of evolutionary advantage for doing so. Maybe it helps eggs grow better. Now, if there are particular variants of that fruit that actually fertilize by wasps laying their eggs in them, then that is going to give them an evolutionary advantage. Now, over time, you'll have figs evolve so that they can more easily attract fig wasps, and you'll have fig wasps evolve so that they can more easily lay their eggs in figs. Ignore the fact that I sounded like I slurred my words there. It was very hard to say that for some reason. But what I'm saying here is that these things can be produced through evolution. It may not seem like it sometimes, but when you think about it, it's like, oh, yeah, I can see how that might happen. Just fascinating things. Um, thought I would share that with everybody. Those two things struck me as I woke up this morning. So as much as I may disagree, I do want to thank Matt because this was actually far more pleasant than my last two videos. I just hope that he isn't like Matt Powell and Matt Walsh because that would be disappointing to actually find that out. It was certainly one of the more interesting topics to cover and given my last video, a breath of fresh air to be honest. But anyway, with that, that is it for this video. Leave a like and subscribe if you like this video. Leave a comment letting me know what you'd like me to do for future videos. As always, a big shout out to my $20 or more patrons. Hugh Jars, Empty Nutkin, Shaggy, Wolfie, Mori, Grey Mole Ghost, Kid Vicious, Sarcha Campbell, Militant Agnostic, Kitten McKitten from Kitten Town, Craig D'Amelio, and Nerthan Termson. If you want to support me financially, you can do so on Patreon. There should be a link there. But anyway, I will see you in the next video. Between you and me, Thank you for watching.